bringing us here. Lord, we know none of us is here by accident. Nothing happens by accident. We're here, and we know that each time we come, you prepare something for us. Lord, we come, we worship you, we sit at your feet. And so we ask today that as you've been ministering, as we've been singing praises to you, and you've been touching and blessing us, we pray, God, that would continue through the teaching of your word. Thank you for your word. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would anoint us, that you would inspire us, Lord, that we would go out, as Jesus said, and be doers of the word and not just hearers. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, what I'd like to do today is start with uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It's a, a verse, our verses that we're all familiar with, and it talks about service. And it says this, this is Paul writing to the church in Rome, and he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and complete will of God. So there we have it. Any questions? All right, worship team. Let, no. That's really it, all in a nutshell. I mean, the Bible is full of verses, full of admonitions to service, but this is a nutshell right there. That's it. It's all contained there. We owe him everything. Um, last week, Jason talked about stewardship. He talked about stewardship of three things. Uh, and we always think of stewardship as money, obviously. But he talked about treasures, our money, our time, and our talents. And I was waiting for him to share a story that his uh, pastor, when he was a child, liked to tell. And it was my mentor, Pastor Brown. He didn't tell the story, so I will tell it to you. And there's this guy, he's praying to God one day. He says, you know, God... I don't have any money, and if you would bless me with some money, I would give it to you. I really would. So God blesses him with money, millions, but he didn't give any to God. And one day he's praying, he says, you know, Lord, I, I really don't have any talent. I, if I had talent, I would give that talent to you. So God blesses him with all sorts of talent. He can do anything, but he doesn't give his talent to God. He said, you know, God, I just don't have time. I'm so busy. Lord, if you just gave me some time, I would give that to you. So God gave him all sorts of time. He had talent, he had time, he had treasures, he had it all. Didn't use any of it for God, so God took it away. So he's sitting there one day, he's praying again, he says, God, honest, I've learned my lesson. Lord, if you would just bless me with some money, I, I would give it to you. And God said, oh, shut up. <laughs> now, I know that's not inspired in the Holy Word, but... There is a place, though, in, Bible, in the Bible, God tells somebody to stop praying. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You can go look for it. But um, there are times when it's not, you just don't need to pray because you already know what you're supposed to do. When we are up here talking about full devotion, we want to do a couple of things. Number one, anytime we get up here, we want to inspire you to live for God, to be more devoted, more fully devoted to him. But we hope that we can also give you some practical advice. Okay, what does that look like? What does that mean? Today, what I want to do is basically four things. First of all, I want to talk to you about why we don't serve God. I want to talk to you about why we do. Give you some examples of how we can serve God, be, be more effective in our service. And, and finally, end up with what, what I believe to be the ultimate reason, the main reason why we serve God. So we're going to talk about those four things. Um, the first one, of course, why we do not serve God. And, and Tim, again, a few weeks ago, so eloquently put this. Service has nothing to do with our salvation. We already have our salvation. It's bought, it's paid for, it's a done deal. We're on our way to heaven. And there's nothing we can ever do that will change that to make us more appealing to God, more pleasing to God, more savable, because we just can't. Salvation is a free gift of God by the Holy Spirit. We accept it by faith. We don't do anything but just accept the free gift. So our service to God is not about earning our way to heaven. That's a done deal. Our service to God, and, and that's point number one, I'm done, all right? So now you're looking at your clock saying, okay, we got about 10 more, no. <laughs> Why do we serve God, though? Well, it's because we are saved and on our way to heaven. It's because we've been given the free gift of God, the free gift of salvation. And that's what Paul is talking to, to us about. He says, I appeal to you, therefore. He has spent 11 chapters talking about what? He's talking about salvation. Romans is this book of what God has done, his work of salvation, and how it's through faith, how God has done all the work, and we just accept it. 
And so when he gets to the end of those 11 chapters, whenever Paul says the, the words therefore in any of his writings, it always means, okay, the teaching's done, now let's talk about practical application. And so that's what he does in chapter 12. What's the natural consequence, the result of what God has done for us? That we give everything back to him. Everything. Starting with the breath in our lungs. It's all his, and we give it freely as a as service to him. Now, at first glance, we look at that and we think, gosh, living sacrifice? Okay, you picture this, this calf on the altar all slaughtered, and that's what I'm supposed to do? Okay, wait a minute, I've got a job, I've got a wife, I've got kids. How do I do that? Well, some people go to the extreme, and they think, well, that means to renounce everything in this world, and I'm not going to get married, I'm not going to have kids, I'm not going to have any worldly pleasure, I'm just going to devote myself to God. And they go and live in a monastery. And there are people who do that. And some people, I believe, maybe they're called to do that. Most people, no. That's the kind of the ultimate. But does God demand that of every single one of us? No, he doesn't. Be and Paul even says somewhere, he talks about being married and, and not being married, and he acknowledges, he says, you know, the person who's not married they actually have more time and energy to devote to the Lord because they don't have that responsibility. But if you are married, that's your responsibility. That's what you're to do. So w how does it look? What, what is it that uh, we're doing because of our salvation? And why are we doing it? Because we're on our way to heaven. I like to use the analogy of, of, the, of the British, the British royal family, okay? There's Queen Elizabeth, there's Prince Charles, and his two sons, Prince William, Prince Henry, okay? They are royalty. And the, and the British, they put a lot of em emphasis on that. They, they hold them in high esteem. There are expectations of them. They're supposed to act a certain way. They're supposed to do this function or go here and represent here. Now, has everything they've ever done, especially Prince Charles, has everything he's ever done brought honor to the family name? No. I'm thinking, Camilla, Lady Di, uh, uh, duh, what's wrong with you, guy? So have they always acted like royalty? No. But has that changed the fact that they're royalty? No. It's like our salvation. We don't always act like Christians. Does that mean we're not? Nope. We still are. Now, God probably sits up there and says, oh, yeah, that's my kid. I, you know, he, I know he does that about me. Because everything we do is a reflection on him, good or bad. So the service we do is because we've been adopted into the family of God. We're his kids, and because we're his kids and we're on the way to heaven, hey, let's, let's act like people that are on their way to heaven, and let's serve him, fully devoted, giving everything to him. So how do we serve God? How do we serve him better? Well, Romans 12, 1 and 2, once again, it starts with this 100% full-on total commitment. The trick is for us, okay, what does that look like on a daily basis? How do I serve God better? And it's not doing away with every enjoyment, every fun activity in your life. It's not that at all. What it is, is finding that area of service that works for you. Now, we want you to be serving here. There's plenty of opportunities. But there's something I, I want to talk about first before we talk about service within the four walls of this church. And that's the, the uh, misconception that a lot of people have that service to God has to take place within the four walls of this church, or at least within a church-sanctioned outreach activity. And while that is part of our service, we spend most of our life, guess what, we're only here a couple hours a week, some of you half an hour. Um, we're not here very much, we're out there. And that's where our service needs to be happening as well, out there. And what does that service look like? Well, it might be your job. I mean, take, for example, the job that I have. I work in a program, I direct a, a program that uh, works with parolees. These are people coming out of prison. They're trying to get their life back together. Some of them have been in prison the last 15, 20 years, or they've been in and out for the last 30 years, and they want to change. Well, they've got a lot of hurdles before them. Some of them have anger management problems. Some of them have substance abuse problems. They're separated from their kids. They can't see their kids. They're, they need to get a job. Nobody's going to hire them. Uh, they didn't finish high school. They need their GED. So we're trying to provide all of these services and help them get back on the track. And the sad reality is some of them never make it. Some of them are not able to overcome these, these hurdles and, and decades of, of uh, poor living and poor choices. 
and they can't get on that track. And that's sad to see, but some of them do. And that's the rewarding part, when you see some people actually put their lives back together. It's very redemptive in nature, and it's something I believe is very near and dear to the heart of God, to help people put their lives back together. Now, is everybody with whom I work a Christian? No. In fact, our big boss is, is anti-Christian. Boy, she's, she's got this radar on, and if anybody mentions the Bible or God, oh, well, she's just all over it. But guess what? I pray for her all the time. I share scriptures with the, the guys that we're working with. Now, I don't quote chapter and verse. I don't use the these and the thous, but you know what? There's a lot of good scriptural principles that you can share with somebody about reaping and sowing, and, and they might call it karma, but the Bible talks about it. And there's lots of things we I can share, and guess what I'm doing? I'm planting the seed. Okay, I didn't give them a chapter and verse, but I gave them a scriptural principle. And, and then you trust the Holy Spirit to apply that, and it may take root and grow. And that's our job. My job is not to save them. My job is to plant seed and to water where I can. And who gives the increase? God gives the increase. We trust the Holy Spirit. But not everybody that I'm working with recognizes that, in fact, they're an instrument in God's hand that he is using to help put people's lives back together. And I find that kind of humorous. Because I, I pray not just for the people we serve, but I pray for my staff, too. Some of them are Christians, some are not. But my prayer for them is, God, open their eyes someday to see that they are an instrument in your hand, that you are using them to help people, to restore. Some people do it. Why do they do it if they're not a Christian? Well, some people believe in the inherent good of man, and if you give him enough choices he, and enough opportunities, he's going to do the right thing ultimately. I, I don't believe that. I believe just the opposite. Man is inherently evil, and given the opportunity, we will always do the wrong thing. Well, not always, but most of the time. But I'm praying for these people that someday God will see. And is it really that far-fetched to think that God could work or speak through somebody who's not his child? <laughs> the Bible's full of examples. Pharaoh's at the top of the list. I mean, he was anything but a godly man. Then there's Balaam. You know, he called himself a prophet, but he didn't have any relationship with God. And God spoke to him how? Okay, I'll use the word. He spoke to him through an ass, all right? God's still speaking through asses sometimes, you know? <laughs> and I have found that sometimes if I don't listen to him through his word or through prayer, he's going to speak to me in other ways. First and foremost, he talks to me through my wife, and I'm not calling her an ass, honestly. But God will speak any way he has to to get our attention. So it's not far-fetched that God uses ungodly people to accomplish his purpose. That's what I get to do five days a week. Is it service to God? You bet it is. And then for you, I don't know what your job is. I don't, you work with people, and I would venture to say some of the people you work with are not Christians. So there's an opportunity every day, as the Bible says, just to let your light shine. You don't have to hit them over the head with the Bible. You just live it in front of them. And from time to time, they'll ask, you know, about that hope that lies within you. What is it that's different about you? There's the opportunity. I, my boss, she calls herself a recovering Catholic. But we have, from time to time, we get to have meaningful conversations. She knows where I stand in my faith. And so I'm able to plant seed, and, and, and I'm still praying that someday she'll come around and she'll see all this. But the truth has been planted there. And so God is at work through us. Whatever we're doing, whether it's a, a job like that, whatever it is, the Bible is, gives us a very clear admonition, and this is Paul talking in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, talking to a different group of people, the church at Corinth, who ultimately it's for us, he says this, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I mean, you might go out here and pick up trash in the parking lot because it looks kind of cluttered on a Sunday morning. You want people to think well of us when they walk up. You're doing it as unto the Lord. That's service. In fact, all of life, if we live it the way it's supposed to be lived, is meant to be an act of worship to God. Everything that we do, everyone we interact with, that's the service that we're to provide, fully devoted service by living for him. It could be at a job. It could be out in the community. I know some of you volunteer for organizations. Um, there's the, the, the clothes uh, ministry and um, the, the food ministry. 
Uh, there's walks and runs, raising money for cancer and heart disease, and there's so many opportunities to serve out in the community, and, and a lot of you do that. And you're, you're doing that alongside people who are not Christians, but as a Christian, guess what? You bring a, a dynamic into that situation because you're doing it as a result of being a part of the family of God. This is your ministry. This is your outreach. And so you're able, and especially if the people know around you know that you're a Christian, that's a great reflection upon God. It's a great reflection upon Jesus Christ and on the church that you're out there involved in the community helping to make a difference, to feed the poor, to do whatever it might, might be, not just within the four walls of a church. One caution, though, one word of admonition. If you're out there and you're not a very good volunteer, you don't show up on time, you're kind of grumpy, don't tell anybody you're a Christian, please. <laughs> God doesn't need any more bad PR. He's got enough bad press, believe me. And don't tell him you go to this church either, all right? Now, tell him you go to the Catholic church, I don't know, so, something. But our lives are a reflection, good or bad. And if, if people know who we are, who we stand for, it's a reflection, good reflection on him. Now, of course, I'd be remiss and I'd be in hot water with my fellow pastors if I didn't talk about service here because service here is very important. There's an old adage, and I don't care if it's the church, I don't care if it's the cancer society, I don't care who it is, that 80% of the people do nothing, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And it's, it's true in our church, it's true in every church, it's true in every organization. What we want you to do is to consider service here as an act of full devotion, that you're giving back to God by giving to others. And so when we serve here, well, first of all, on a regular basis, I mean, it's in the bulletin, we make announcements, hey, there's this opportunity. It might be with the kids, it might be in the nursery, it might be some sort of outreach we're doing. We did something you know, with Chris's group and we reached out to the homeless kids here in Redlands. There are always opportunities that are presenting themselves. And a lot of them do not have a life sentence where you, you volunteer to be in the nursery and you're in there every Sunday now till you die. We try to avoid that. But there are one-shot kind of opportunities where, hey, you, you get involved, this is a one-time thing, and, and, and you do. So there are plenty of opportunities, but maybe you sit there and none of these really resonate with you or it's not clicking and you're just not feeling like this is, this right. but you want to get involved? You know what? Come and talk to one of the pastors. All right, and we'll, we'll look for an opportunity for you to serve. And you can tell us what is it that you're passionate, what is it that you like to do. Because your service needs to be along the lines of, of your talent, of your gifting, of what God has equipped you to do. So if, he, if you don't have a talent, if you don't enjoy something, well, it's probably not your gifting. Okay, there's, there's typically three, three ways that you know if something is your spiritual gift. First and foremost, you're going to enjoy it. All right? Secondly... You're going to see some fruit. You're going to see that it's effective. And third, the body is going to give feedback and say, you know what, when you do that, I, I get blessed. They're going to affirm that gift. That's how you know I have gifting. But you might be sitting there saying, you know what, I, I don't even know what my spiritual gifts are. And notice I said plural. Most people say spiritual gift. Our experience here is most people don't have one spiritual gift. Most people have multiple spiritual gifts. You know, the, the story of uh, Jesus told about the talents, the one person had one, one person had five, one person had ten. Now, he's talking about money, of course, but the, the analogy is talents that God gives to us. And so we all have these gifts. And here's what's interesting. Yes, we're going to appear before God, and we're going to say, I'm here by the blood of Jesus Christ, ticket's been punched, and, and we're welcome into heaven. But the Bible also talks about sending head building materials and it talks about building on in this life with wood hay stubble gold and it says here's how your works are going to be tested will they go through the fire once they pass through the fire will they stand well then that's done for the right reason and it's it's done as unto god and so i believe that when we stand before god as jesus taught us in the parable of the talents that he is going to ask us he's going what did you do with those talents, those spiritual gifts that I gave to you. Well, you know what? I didn't really didn't have opportunity. I didn't have time, and, but I took care of it. I kept it all nice, and it's all still polished. It's just like new, you know? And he's going to go, ah, it's not why I gave it to you, to protect it and keep it and hide it away. You know, I, I, I gave you this to, not to put on a bushel, but to put it on a hill. Or we could say, you know what? I, I was able to say I did this and this, and I was involved here, and, 
And what are the words we're going to hear? Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. Now, enter into the joy of the Lord. I look forward to that. And believe me, I don't want to show up on that day and say, well, I really didn't do anything. I want to be able to say, because of what you did for me, here's what I have to offer. Not to get into heaven. I'm going to be in heaven. But just because I want to please him. And so that's our prayer for you, that you will do the same thing. But you may be saying, but I don't know what my spiritual gifts are. Well, you need to discover what your spiritual gifts are. Ah, commercial. We have a class that we do a couple times a year. It's called Discovery. And what we do is we go through and look at the, the spiritual gifts. There's several places in the New Testament where they're actually listed. We go through those. We explain what each of the spiritual gifts are. But more importantly, there are assessments that you take home and you do. And it takes a while, a few hours to work through those things. But at the end of it, you've got an idea. Okay, this is my spiritual gifting. These, these things. And when you do that, and, and if you don't want to wait for the next class, come see me, come see one of the pastors. We'll give you the packet, and you can go through it. We'll explain it. We'll sit down with you after you've done the assessments and talk. I just did this with somebody a couple of weeks ago. And we sat down and said, well, I see this one. Yeah, because I'm doing this, and I can see that. But I don't understand this one. So we were able to say, well, that means this and this, and here's some opportunity. Here's some things to think about or explore as possible avenues of ministry according to the spiritual gifting that you've been, been given. So I encourage you to either, if you haven't done so, if you don't know what your spiritual gifting is, attend the class, see us, we'll get you the packet, and you can work through it. We'll sit down with you and answer any questions that you have about discovering your spiritual gifts. Because we believe God will ask us, okay, what did you do? with what I gave to you. So those are some ideas of how we can get involved, and we really want you, I, and, and I know most of you are involved in some way, some capacity, serving God. If not here, out there in the community, we'd like to see more here, obviously. But I encourage you for the, in, in that, and, and bless you for that, and encourage you to, if you're only operating at 50%, you know, you've got other spiritual gifts that are lying dormant, well, seek out an opportunity. I mean, when your life is fulfilled, when you're operating in all the spiritual gifts, and there, none of them is lying there dormant. So ultimately, though, let me close with this. What do we do? I mean, why do we serve ultimately? Well, let me ask you, how do people feel? Pe people have different feelings about directions, okay? You go out and you buy that piece of furniture, and you and your, your spouse are going to put it together, okay? So you open the box, and you get out the directions. Tell me if this happens at your house. And one of you starts reading the directions, all right? And you're kind of going through the directions, and okay, A goes into B, and, and you get to about page seven of the directions, okay? You're almost halfway through, and you look over, and in my case, there's my wife, and she's got it halfway put together already. And now I'm, I'm freaking out because, okay, did you do this? And how did you know to do that? Well, I just figured it out. Now, I know it's, it's usually the other way around with men and women, but she's actually more mechanically inclined than I am. And I stumble over these directions. This is, I'm going to show you one of my pet peeves. Okay, you, if you went to Ikea, you got a piece of furniture, and where were the directions written? Not in the United States. They were written in Sweden. And, and I think they go through the factory and say, hey, anybody speak English? Okay, you're, doing, you're translating these directions, you know. Have you ever read directions like that? Or in China? And you're kind of going, what? Who wrote these things? You can't make any sense out of them. And then I stumble further because I'll read the directions and it'll say A goes into B and B goes into C. That's not good enough for me. I want to know why A goes into B and why doesn't B go into C before A goes into to, to B? And my wife's sitting there, just do it. Just follow the directions. But I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense. It, it, does that sound like anyone else? Some people love the directions. And some people, they lose, the first thing they do is lose the Oh, great. Some, some, some put, put in the fireplace, start a fire. And then anybody hold the direction for like 10 years after it's put together? <laughs> and you, you, d you got rid of the furniture. You sold it at a garage sale. But five years later, oh, here's the directions for that. I should have given it to the person at the garage sale. All right. Okay, my true confession. <laughs> well... We say all the time, you know, we have kids. We say, wouldn't it be great if kids came with a manual? If life came with a manual, if it came with directions, guess what? It did. We call it the Holy Bible. It's the scriptures. 
and it's full of directions on how to live this life. And now, let me read this scripture. In fact, the Bible even tells us it is a book of instructions for us. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, this is Paul writing to Timothy. We're just reading Paul a lot today, but writing to Timothy, young pastor, and he says this, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you've learned it and how from infancy you've known the Holy Scriptures, and here we go, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. What's righteousness? Righteous living. In training in how to live so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, there is a huge misconception out in the world among non-Christians, and unfortunately some Christians have this misconception that this is a book of rules. The thou shalt's and the thou shalt's nots, and, and you better do this because God's standing there with a big stick, and if you step out of line, man, he's going to whack you and knock you back in the line just because he's the boss and he gets to set the rules and he gets to make us do whatever he wants. And we don't understand, and we don't get it, we don't like it, but we're get, we better behave, otherwise he's going to send us to hell. Huge misconception. That's not the Bible at all. God is saying, you know what? I created this world to work a certain way. And, and if you want it to work correctly, follow the instructions. If you want it to work correctly, follow the instructions. Now, there are some things the Bible doesn't talk about. It doesn't talk about the law of gravity, but guess what? It's still true. Now, there's nobody probably, well, maybe there's some people who tried to keep you jumping off a building. But you can say, I, I think that's a stupid law, and I don't want to follow it. And you can step off a building. Nobody's going to punish you or give you a citation or anything, but they'll pick you up in pieces on the ground. Because there is a law called gravity. It has nothing to do with somebody getting mad at you or hitting you with a stick. It's just a result. You defied a law, you defied a principle, and you paid the price. So in this life, God says, if you want life to work, follow these instructions. If you'll do this and this and this, you will live a life that is fulfilled. It's a life of purpose and it's a life of joy. Now, another misconception, look what God is not saying. He's not saying you're, gonna have, you're never going to have any problems. It's going to be a bed of roses. Nothing's ever going to go wrong if you follow my, my precepts. I wish the Bible says that, but it doesn't. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, this is the Sermon on the Mount, in verse 45, he says, He, this is God, causes his son to rise on the evil and upon the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Bottom line is this. Sometimes life just sucks. It's hard. It's not easy for anyone. No one gets out of it alive. There's going to be disease. There's going to be hardships. There's going to be injustice. There's going to be the death of a loved one. And it's going to happen to all of us. The good news is we don't have a God that's going to intervene and make it easy and take away all the pain. And, and granted, those people who have set themselves up as the God of their life, sure, they want God to come in when things get tough. And, and when he doesn't, well, I'm not going to serve that God because they are the God of their life and they know best and they're calling the shots. But God knows what's going on. We don't. All right. We think we do. I, I love the analogy. I remember when, when uh, our youngest son, Philip, and he, he's here, and he's had getting this experience now. Ugh. When it was t my turn to take him to the doctor and get shots, all right, and here's this little baby lying there, and they take off his diaper, and here comes the nurse with the big needle and gives him a shot, which I know was for his good. And as this little baby gives me this look of betrayal. <laughs> and with his look, he was saying, I trusted you. You let this lady hurt me. And then, of course, here comes it. And my heart broke. My heart melted. And in that moment, I understood God like I'd never understood him before. Because there are things that come upon me that I don't like. I would change in a heartbeat. But he says, it's for your good. It's for your strength. You're going to get stronger through this. This is going to help you. I don't get it at the time. And sometimes I get down the road, I still don't get it. I mean, I still have questions, things that have gone wrong in life that I didn't get, I don't understand. 
a lot of times we have the privilege of getting down the road and we look back and we go, okay, now I see. I understand what God was doing. Not always, but a lot of times we do. And it reminds us, okay, he is working all things together for good. He knows what he's doing. And even though we have hardships, what I think is, is great is we don't serve a God who's up there in heaven somewhere and he leaves us alone. What does he say in Hebrews 13, 5? Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And in Matthew 28, 20, his last instructions before he leaves and goes back to heaven, right after he tells his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospels, make disciples, he says this, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. To me, that's the joy. Not that we're going to get out of all the hardships, but that he's going to be there with us. So we serve, essentially, and the Bible tells us this, the, Old Te- the New Testament especially, is full. Have, have you ever counted how many times the word servant shows up there? Servant, be a servant. I used to think when Jesus said, well, the greatest in my kingdom will be a servant to all. I said, okay, so I'll, I'll serve everybody, and then I'll get promoted, and I'll be at the top, and then everybody will serve me. Huh. He turns it upside down. He says, the greatest one is the slave, the servant. The ones that are being served, they're at the bottom. That's how my, my kingdom is upside down from this world. It's, the world considers it backwards, doesn't understand it. It's because, and this took me a long time to realize this, we were created to be servants. We were not created to be masters. We want to run our own lives. We think we know what's best, but we really don't. I may may be pushing 60 years old, but guess what? I'm still a a child in his eyes. He still knows infinitely more than I do. And that's the faith and trust we have in him. I am wired, I am put together to be a servant, not a master. And it's when I operate in that and I serve others, what does the Bible say? It's more blessed to give than to receive. You felt it. You do something for someone just because. And how do you feel inside? You feel good. That is confirmation that that's what you and I were created to do, is to be servants and serve one another. I mean, there was a time when I thought I was wired to be a professional baseball player. Boy, I wanted it. I worked so hard. And I, and I listen to these guys to this day. You know, they, they interview them after their MVP of the league or something. Well, you just got to work hard. And, and I sit there and think, you do not. If you don't have the talent, it doesn't wor- matter how hard you work. You can work hard. If you don't have it, you don't have it, all right? And I wanted it, but, but the, you know, there were other guys that the scouts came and looked at, and I struggled with that, but, oh well, I came to realize that uh, that was not my calling in life. And after years of therapy, I'm doing better. So. <laughs> and there's confirmation even in the world of we being created to be servants. We're, we're wired this way. You look at the people who live for themselves. I mean, we just go over here to Hollywood. We see the movie stars, the millionaires. They've got the money. They've got fame. They've got everything. Are they so many of happy? They're miserable. They'll take their life. They get strung out on drugs. Why? Because it doesn't fulfill. Then we go to the other end of the spectrum, and we look for examples of people who are just the opposite. And, and Mother Teresa always comes to everybody's mind. Had nothing. Lived in the, the slums in Calcutta, Served the people, one of the happiest, most joyful people that's ever lived because she had learned the truth. I was put here to serve. And so it's when we're serving that we find that, that peace, we find the fulfillment, we find the joy. So service is what we're, you're hardwired to do. If you don't do it, you're just going to be frustrated. It's why you were created. It's your purpose. And it really is the only path to happiness, fulfillment, and joy in Jesus Christ is serving others. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, first of all, that you gave us a great example. We think of what Paul said in Philippians. Let this mind be in you. Jesus, in the form of God, he came, took upon himself the the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. We thank you for that example of servanthood. We thank you that Jesus went all the way, even the death of the cross, He paid the ultimate price as a servant to example it for us. And we pray, Lord, that as we wrap up this series on full devotion, that you would quicken our hearts once again to be more fully devoted to you in our service, that we would recognize that you have called us, you have equipped us, you've gifted us, you've given us instructions, you've given us everything we need 
to serve you, to live for you, to be more fully devoted. So we pray, God, that you would inspire each one here today to do more, to give more, to be more fully devoted to you. And we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen.